Uh, Madam Chair, I believe we're all set to go. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fembridge. Here. Mr. Valencia. Here. Ms. Wewell. Here. Ms. Barbraza. Here. Mr. Langham. Here. Yeah. Ms. Loeb. Here. Thank you. The floor is yours, Mr. Sambuch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we will move to start with the hearing schedule for 1 p.m. And with that, we will ask if there are any requests for withdrawals or deferrals from this time frame. Madam Chair, this is Patrick, Attorney Patrick Sweeney appearing for 27 Mystic Street, Ward 2. My office is Marcy Sweeney, 261 Main Street, Charlestown. I'm sorry, you're seeking a deferral? Yes. Okay, Mr. Stembridge, can you read into the record first? Certainly, Madam Chair. That will be for case BOA 154-8361. With the address of 27 Mystic Street. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you. Uh, my name is Attorney Patrick Sweeney. I represent the uh, Palantir at 27 Mystic Street. We're requesting a brief deferral. Uh, yesterday, my client received a uh, updated refusal letter, and that was transmitted to me this morning. So we'd like an opportunity to go over some of the uh, additions to that letter. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Javier? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll say April 9th, uh, just in case there's any updates to plans or any uh, additional information needed for that. Does that work, Mr. Sweeney? We have provided updated plans. Uh, Mr. Sweeney, does April 9th work? Can we have an earlier date, Madam Chair? Madam Chair, March 26, if that works, I just, it, it needs to be re-advertised. It, it would be cutting it close around that time. Fine, I understand. The ninth will work then. Okay, may I have a motion? I make a motion to defer to April the 9th. You have a second? Sir. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Wewell? Yes. Ms. Better Barraza? Yes. Mr. Langham? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Logue? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you. See you Are there any further requests for, for, for withdrawal from this time, from this time frame? Hearing, Hearing none. Hearing none. Hearing none, uh, we will start off with case BOA 146066 at the address of 61 Brook Street. If the applicant and or their representative is present, would they explain to the board, please? Yes, uh, Mr. Stembridge, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Richard Lenz at the business address of 245 Summer Street, East Boston, on behalf of the petitioner, uh, Mr. Edward DeVoe. Um, and this is a pre-existing three-unit dwelling uh, located in the uh, lower Eagle Hill section of East Boston. If we can jump down probably to uh, 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 slide five, uh, four, yeah, start there. Uh, that's probably a good place to start. Yeah. So we have an existing condition. It's a lot that's uh, 25 feet wide by about 75 feet deep. Uh, it's dimensionally non-conforming currently under the 3 up 2000 district. Uh, if we jump to the next slide, please. Uh, showing just that we're not identified in the flood zone, although I will have a, a, a chance to talk briefly about the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District, as I know uh, the BPDA's recommendation have made some comments about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you see the building here. Uh, it's the existing, as I said, standard triple decker. Our proposal uh, would change the occupancy from three units uh, to four units. Uh, the proposal would also include the addition of a private roof deck on the roof. Um, our use of the lower level, although it looks uh, relatively short from this angle, um, we see our elevations uh, and profile view 
Uh, there is a full walkout condition to the back of the property, so there is a sufficient area uh, to allow for light and windows, full-size windows in the uh, lower level unit. Uh, if we could jump to the next slide, please. Uh, so different street views here. Uh, looking down Brook Street towards the Freeman Street Park, uh, relatively close to the, or, uh, the airport T station, which is located about two blocks uh, from the site. So another view of the building here. We could probably jump to the uh, site plan. Um, so showing our existing conditions, we don't change anything with respect to the building footprint itself. Uh, so the non-conformities that currently exist under Article 53 are no, not exacerbated except when it comes to the items uh, that Article 53 requires for usable open space. Um, we have a um, requirement currently under our zoning that 300 square feet of open space be provided for each unit. Um, as I've mentioned in previous presentations uh, since January 18th, the recommendations for Plan East Boston uh, actually eliminate usable open space requirements, uh, the maximum floor area ratio, uh, and uh, will allow for, in this particular zoning district, multifamily use. Uh, so while a number of the violations that we do currently have on Article 53 uh, are, are uh, triggered because of the current zoning uh, that's in place, uh, many of these do get eliminated uh, eventually once the planning spots and recommendations have been fully adopted by the Zoning Commission. Um, with respect to the open space, um, one of the things that planning spots and recommendations do change with new zoning is uh, permeable area lot coverage. Uh, this uh, existing condition uh, will comply with both of those uh, requirements under new zoning for the EBR4 district, specifically that the building not occupy more than 60% of the uh, area of the lot, and that there be at least 30% permeability, both of which we're able to achieve, and as are reflected in the recommendation of the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Next slide, please. Uh, so we do have the existing conditions of the basement. There's uh, open area, utility, storage, et cetera. If we go to the next slide. We can see the proposed modifications that create a one bedroom, uh, which is towards the rear. We have uh, about 736 square feet total. Uh, we have two means of egress, as well as uh, a dedicated area for utility that is accessible to the entire building. Uh, the introduction of sprinkler uh, tanks for the building as well, as you can see in the towards the front portion of the building. Uh, there's no other real change to the building itself if we jump to I believe it's uh, slide uh, 18 for the roof deck. You can see the scope of the roof deck as well. Uh, so we do propose a, roof, a private roof deck that is accessed by hatch. We're not proposing to introduce um, a head house. Uh, as you can see, the alignment of this is uh, sufficiently set back from the front of the building where it's barely visible. Uh, and because this building is set closest to the left property line, uh, we've aligned our roof deck with that as well. Uh, with respect to the relief, uh, the additional relief that would be relevant in this case, uh, the current condition of three residential units uh, would be a pre-existing use that predates uh, the Boston Zoning Enabling Act, and therefore uh, there is no parking required um, because certainly this was an allowable use, an existing use prior to 1993 when Article 53 was introduced. Um, the Zoning Code does state that for each additional unit you're proposing, you're required to add uh, a parking, uh, the required parking space for the additional units proposed, not for the existing units. And in this case, um, as we often see when we're, we're dealing with one parking space, uh, the public works policy with respect to curb cuts, even if one were capable of being uh, added to this site, uh, is to not allow for curb cuts where one parking space is being proposed. Uh, so in this instance, we're requesting relief from that parking requirement. As I indicated, the uh, Proximity of public transit uh, is relatively close, less than two blocks uh, to our south, uh, heading towards the Freeman Street Park. Um, the one other last item I would like to address, uh, certainly referenced in the uh, BPDA's recommendation, uh, which recommended, even though this would align with planning spots and recommendations for use, density, and size, uh, was that this should not be permitted because it also lies with the Coastal Flood Resiliency Overlay District. I would point out to the board, and, and certainly I've made this, my comments known regarding the uh, changes that are being proposed, specifically with respect to East Boston, uh, where we do have a good deal of uh, coastal flood uh, resiliency areas. Uh, this site is not located in a flood zone, uh, not even uh, 
uh, in any of the uh, elevated flood zones that are uh, usually identified for those types of regulations. More importantly, uh, 25A uh, is applicable currently to projects that uh, come under uh, either small or large project review, of which this project does not trigger. Uh, I do uh, understand that there is uh, an amendment to the uh, Article 53 that uh, indicates that uh, coastal flood resiliency will apply, and that assumes the Zoning Commission adopts that recommendation. Uh, but this application uh, was submitted long before that recommendation was finalized, and we feel that uh, the current uh, state of 25A uh, would exempt this project from uh, any coastal flood resiliency uh, guidelines. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions of the board uh, with respect to this proposal. Thank you, Attorney Liz. Any questions from the board? Yeah, um, Madam Chair, I would like to, for Jeff Hampton to speak on this um, because I do see that the project is on a coastal flood resilient overlay district and the BPDA has made recommendations in regards to basement that there not be a habitable, habitable bedroom because of its prone to flooding, um, potential flooding risk. Um, Jeff, can you make a comment regarding this project as what the applicant just mentioned, not really applying um, uh, those guidelines to this property, even though on your, um, on your um, coastal flood resilient design guideline, it kind of just notes all of East Boston as being a risk to flooding. Sure, sure. Thank you, Ms. Barraza. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Jeff Hampton. Uh, this is a recommendation that we make throughout the city, even though we do know that sea fraud would not be applicable to this project. Uh, we have made this similar recommendation to other neighborhoods in the city, specifically South Boston, where somebody has increased the number of dwelling units to include um, a basement unit. Uh, knowing that the sea fraud regs don't apply, it is still our policy and belief to put this on the record that this is a concern for us to have units in the basement, whether it be a walkout or fully, some, you know, a fully defined basement. Uh, the BPDA likes to put it on the record that just basement units within the sea fraud in general is just a concern for us. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? I have a question, Madam Chair, and it just occurred to me, and this is to Attorney Lynn's. If this basement unit were to have flooding or water, how how would that be remedied? Or is that anticipated in the plans? Um, I, I don't know if we have somebody from Joy Street here, but I can, I can speak to, and, and again, this has been a concern uh, throughout the conversation on planning spots and recommendations and sort of scooping up a lot of these smaller uh, buildings that are uh, what I would say well outside the flood zone, um, you know, to sort of bring those into uh, sea fraud uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, I'm not sure if we have either Tria or um, um, Sharon on the call, uh, but they could address any of those concerns, and I'm sure that we could uh, certainly address a des some design elements that would um, uh, at least try to mitigate some of those issues, but we don't see this location as being uh, at greater risk simply because it's uh, only because it's in the sea fraud. Uh, as I said, it's, it's well outside the flood zone. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have public testimony? Hello, Madam Chair, members of the board. Melody Gomez with the Office of Neighborhood Service. ONS hosted an abutters meeting for this project on May 2nd, 2023. The applicant also met with the Eagle Hill Civic Association and the Maverick Central Neighborhood Association in May of 2023. The Maverick Central Neighborhood Association voted to support the project. At this time, our office would like to defer judgment to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Sebastian Park from Councilor Coletta's office. The council would like to go and support this project. Thank you. Thank you. No additional raised hands. Thank you. Okay. With that, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Uh, yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. 
Ms. Ruo? Yes. Ms. Barbaraza? Yes. Mr. Langham? Yes. Ms. Loeb? Yes. Chair also votes yes. The motion carries. Good luck. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Next case has been deferred, and there may be some question for this case, which is case BOA 1552194, with the address of 457 to 469A West Broadway. Is, is there someone, um, is, is the applicant and or representative present to explain this? Madam Chair, I'm this hobby. I'm not sure if the applicant's here, but we do have a note that says they're requesting withdrawal. Um, the board can just make a quick motion to vote on that. Okay. Uh, with that, may I have a motion? Motion to withdraw the case for 457 to 469A West Broadway. Okay. Second. Javier, are we approving the withdrawal or uh, making a motion? Uh, what are yes, to approve the, uh, the withdrawal. Okay. okay I'll second some... that motion. Thank you. Mr. Stumbridge? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Lewell? Yes. Ms. Bedebraza? Yes. Mr. Langham? Yes. Ms. Loeb? Yes. There are also votes yes. Motion carries. That we will move on to case BOA 1540339 with the address of 675 East 4th Street. Is the applicant and or their representative present to explain to the board? Present. John McGann, present. Matthew Johnson, present. Um, whoever is going to speak, if you give your uh, address and then proceed. Uh, John McGinn, Gavin Foundation, 675 East 4th Street, South Boston, Mass. Please proceed. Madam Chair, we're looking for a variance to put in a handicap. Uh, ramp to our residential recovery home located at 675 East 4th Street. The property is enclosed by a brick uh, fence or wall around it. We feel it will have will not impede uh, or obstruct any of our neighbors. We have fly in the neighborhood and submitted letters of support. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have public testimony? Hello, Madam Chair, members of the board, Lydia Pulaski with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. The 675 East 4th Street proponents distributed flyers to abutting properties notifying neighbors of the proposal to install an ADA ramp at their address. At this time, our office is unaware of any concerns with this application. We would like to defer to the judgment of the board at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good, Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. This is Laura Toledano from Consul Flynn's office. Please note that Consul Flynn and Consul Murphy submitted a support letter on this matter to the board as the installation on an ADA complaint ramp will allow for accessibility for persons with disability who require assistance and treatment programs for substance use and disorders. This ramp will allow the Gavin House to serve all who need their assistance and aligns with the mission of the City of Boston Disability Commission. Council of Flynn respectfully asks that the board provide every consideration for its approval. Thank you. Councilor Murphy, would you like to add to that? Yes, um, thank you, Laura, from Council of Flynn's office. Um, just wanted to come on personally. I know I submitted a letter um, along with Council of Flynn and my own. Um, thank you to John McGann and the Gavin Foundation. And the Gavin House is a wonderful neighbor. It's been there for decades now and just want to make sure that we get this ramp passed through because everyone needs recovery services and this will make it accessible to all. So looking forward to having this pass and have the Gavin House be 
you know, a place where those with disabilities with mobility issues can access the services that are much needed. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no additional raised hands. Okay. With that, may I have a motion? Yes. I make a... Oh, go ahead, Alan. No, you can go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. All right, I make a motion to approve this project. No, right. second. Thank you, Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Wewell. Yes. Ms. Bedabaza. Yes. Mr. Langham. Yes. Ms. Logue. Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have case BOA 1553384 with the address of 8 to 10 Mercer Street. If the applicant and or their representative is present, would they please? Yes, thank you. Ah, yes, sure. thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Stembridge. Uh, Madam Chair, members, my name is George Morenzi. I'm an attorney with the business address of 350 West Broadway in South Boston. I represent Mark Little. Um, Madam Chair, members, this is an application for a, uh, a six-unit building, uh, some procedural history. Most important, uh, I would point out that this project has already been approved uh, by the Zoning Board of Appeal. Uh, it has been approved by the Zoning Board of Appeal twice, as a matter of fact. Uh, by way of explanation, this originally came to the board as an ALT application for an addition uh, to an existing two-family structure to um, convert into a six-unit building. It was approved by this board on October 27th of 2020. As I mentioned, this first uh, was um, uh, applied for and construction began under an ALT application. During construction, um, building walls uh, collapsed during construction. Once that occurred, um, essentially there was no uh, wall left from the initial or the original structure. ERT required that my client convert it from an ALT or alteration permit to an ERT or erect permit. This came back to the Board of Appeal on March 14th, 2023. Uh, it was approved again as an ERT and for two additional violations, uh, one uh, owing to the fact that the number of off street parking spaces was reduced at the time from six to five. Uh, and at that time, the number of units was also reduced to, uh, to five. So it's gone from a six unit project to a five unit project. Uh, there was also a violation cited at that time for an insufficient rear yard setback. Uh, the building's approved height was at 42 and a half feet. Building was uh, resumed uh, process of uh, construction. Uh, a field inspector some months ago um, took a laser measure and determined that the top of the uh, of the head house or the, the partial top story of the building was actually several inches above the 42 and a half feet uh, that was um, approved. Uh, this was because the foundation height changed uh, during construction from what was originally approved. Uh, my client was faced with uh, either seeking a variance for an additional height violation or correcting the violation. My client corrected the violation. Uh, he literally just uh, took the offending several inches of the off of the top of the head house. He then submitted as constructed plans to ISD uh, to verify that condition. At that time, the plans examiner uh, cited the project for previously unsighted violations uh, that had been missed um, certainly in, during the uh, the uh, the in the refusal letter uh, that precipitated the March. 14th, 2023 ZBA approval. So on the refusal letter that issued, uh, it will be noted that there are uh, what the plans examiner is referring to as new, new variances, but these are four conditions that already existed. Uh, number one, uh, there was a citation for, I referred earlier to the fact that South Boston has uh, a maximum building height violation under the dimensional table, but then because of the 2017 amendment to the code, Article 68, the existing height of any building existing at the time of the amendment becomes the new zoning height for that parcel. When this was converted from an ALT to an ERT, 
the plans examiner should at that time have cited this additional violation, but he did not, in fact, notice it until this refusal letter issued on August 21 of 2023. So again, that is no change. It's simply a condition that a violation that previously had not been cited was cited owing to the fact that the plans examiner recognized the violation. He also cited a lack of a five-foot buffer area in the rear where the parking spaces are located. Nothing has changed with respect to the location of the parking spaces, but again, the plans examiner noticed this violation in August of 2023. The area where that five-foot buffer, I guess, is supposed to be is actually a retaining wall due to a grade change on the site. So it wouldn't be providing a landscape buffer to anything since it's a land, I'm sorry, since it's a retaining wall with packed earth behind it. Also, the plans examiner, for the first time in August of 2023, cited a driveway violation that the driveway is not 10 feet wide. It is, in fact, nine feet wide. It has been nine feet wide since this was originally approved in October 2020, but it was cited by the plans examiner last August. And finally, again, all of the parking area, the number of parking spaces and the maneuvering area have all been the same and were the same at the time of the October 2020 hearing and the March 14th, 2023 hearing. The plans examiner also cited that as a violation. So I can contend that this is a bit of housekeeping to clean up violations that were cited late in the game. And I can also represent to the board that the building is substantially complete. It's about two weeks away from certificate of occupancy. ISD has allowed for construction to progress during this latest appeal to the board. I'll pause there, Madam Chair, and I'll take any questions that any members may have. Thank you. And thank you for clarifying all of those. Any questions from the board? I have a question. When was the last time this project was approved in front of this board? What date was that? Was it the March 2023, Mr. Attorney Marinci? Yes, sorry, I was muted. Yes, March 14th, 2023. Okay. And I just kind of would like some clarification on A02, the site plan. Are the five parking spaces at the rear within the property lines for, I think, for 8 and 10 Melser Street? Yes, they are there within the property lines of this project, 8 to 10 Melser Street. Okay. Do you own 12 Melser Street? No, 12 Melser Street. The first time that this went to the board, there was a companion application for 12 Melser Street for the shared driveway. 12 Melser Street also had its own use premises application, which was approved for parking for two cars behind 12 Melser Street. Again, it was a companion case with this case in October 2020. So there will be an easement area along the property line between the two properties, allowing for parking at the rear of both parcels. Okay. So 12 Melser Street has two parking spaces on its property, and it's using that main driveway. And this property, 8 to 10, has an easement to use that nine-foot driving aisle, correct? Yes, it's actually a cross easement. It allows both properties to be able to use a common driveway to provide access to the rear. All right. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Madam Chair? Yes. There are some comments that Bob D'Amico submitted. Okay. If you want to read them. For 8 to 10 Melser Street, to remove space number five for safer maneuverability. I don't know if Bob is still present. Yes, I'm here. Is that the only comment, Mr. Sumbridge? Yes. Okay. That's why I was asking the question, because Bob, as I was looking at your comment, there's a drawing that is noted on the 
pop plan, and I didn't know that's what you were referring to, which was kind of a parking space behind 12 Malta Street. Mr. Miko? Uh, yes. Um, another issue is the width of the driveway. Um, it's pretty tight, and if there's any snow or ice on, on the ground, it's going to be pretty difficult to gain access to the rear uh, parking spaces. But in order to have a clear maneuverability, I, I think by removing space number five, uh, oh, I'm sorry, space number one, I can't see that down. I'm sorry, space number five, I apologize. It's kind of small, yes. Uh, space number five and making the other spaces wider, it would uh, give adequate maneuverability. But I'm still worried about the width of the driveway. It's, um, it, it's kind of narrow, but uh, I, I can't go along with that. But uh, again, I'll leave that up to the discretion of the board. But I can't, uh, I can't in good conscience uh, go along with that. Thank you. Mr. Morancy, is the parking different than when we approved it the previous time? No, it's it's the same, Madam Chair. It's it's been approved. It was uh, it's been approved uh, by the BBD BBDA after design review, actually now twice, uh, and the project is uh, is built. Quite frankly. Okay. Questions from the board. Other questions? Uh, do you have a variance for amount of parking currently? Yes, there was a, a, a variance for insufficient off street parking that was okay. previously granted. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may we have public testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. At this time, the Mayor's Office like to defer to the judgment of this board. Uh, ONS conducted an abutters meeting on December 4th, um, where the proponent presented uh, the plans and described uh, the current circumstances that they were seeking to go through for the CBA. Uh, there was a mix of opinions expressed. Um, several residents expressed support, support for the project, uh, citing that the long construction process and they're eager, eager to see it finished. Um, another resident mentioned some concerns regarding where the mechanicals be located on the property, and another expressed concerns regarding um, their, part, their driveway being blocked by various uh, vans and delivery trucks. The proponent was on that call and expressed a desire to work with them to figure out how to come up with a solution so that problem doesn't occur again. Uh, later, our office did receive uh, a call expressing opposition, citing the number of variances uh, being sought. Um, the Dorchester Heights Neighborhood Association was in support of this proposal. Um, with all that information, we'll defer to the board at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I have no raised hands. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'm going to put forward a motion of approval with a proviso that parking be reduced to four for maneuverability. Is there a second? Um, Madam, yes. I hate to interrupt a, interrupt a motion, Madam Chair, but my client is actually, these are condominium units that are actually being pre-marketed based on five parking spaces that have already been approved twice by this board. And, uh, and, and Madam Chair, this is Javier. That would be uh, helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, following up from Attorney Marazzi, yes, I believe that would also cause a further violation in which you would have to seek new relief for four parking spots instead of five. Okay, so I'm going to change my motion and um, do a new motion uh, with a motion of approval. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Wewell? Yes. Ms. Bedebraza? Yes. Mr. Langham? Yes. Ms. Logue? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And I appreciate the thoughtful reconsideration of the initial motion. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Next, we have case BOA 153. 0363 with the address of 28 Evergreen Street. If the applicant and or the their representative is present, will they explain the case to the board, please? Okay, there's a raised hand. Um, Donald, are you looking at is this your project? Yes. 
Oh. Yes, I is the uh, are we rolling? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Don Weiss. I'm with the law firm of Dane Torpy, located in downtown Boston at 175 Federal Street. Uh, I'm here representing a homeowner, Jesse Wilson, and uh, also with this is the project architect, Bruce Miller. <clears throat> this is a proposed conversion of a three family that's been on the site since roughly 1891 to a four family. This is a multi-generational house. Just grew up in this house with his family. Uh, his parents still live in the building. He lives here as well with his wife, Rose, uh, son, Ellis, and daughter, Violet. Uh, his son is 10, his daughter is seven. Uh, they have all been living in a two bedroom apartment up to this point. It's the city, uh, people make do, but they've been looking to expand. There is a third unit on the top floor of the building that they could in theory expand into. Uh, but they have a long-time tenant, uh, a single woman who's there who they don't want to displace. So they began to look at uh, options for more living space on the property. Originally, they wanted to convert the barn uh, be uh, behind the building. They looked at that fairly closely, uh, but really the breakthrough of the design was adding a, an extension to the back of the building and demolishing the barn uh, with the effect of essentially pooling their backyard, their neighbor's backyards, the large double side yard, uh, creating a lot of open space. Um, Jesse has met uh, extensively with his neighbors uh, and has a great deal of support. We have support letters in the file from multiple abutters, uh, including three direct abutters. There are a few abutters as well who have been informed of the project and just weren't interested in pursuing their involvement in the process. Uh, but uh, Jesse's done an exemplary job of outreach. One support letter in particular uh, by a neighbor who lives uh, diagonally across the street, can't be here today is Dr. Ted Landsmark, who's one of the more prominent uh, members of the land use community in Boston across several decades. I won't read his letter, but I will quote two sentences from it. Dr. Landsmark wrote, uh, speaking of Jesse's uh, proposal, the concept and planning are exemplary of new directions the city must take to meet our housing needs while continuing the presence of this great neighbor and his family on the street where he grew up. This project has my unequivocal support. Um, we're going to have our architect, Bruce Miller, uh, briefly walk you through the plans. As I think you'll see, uh, as Bruce shows you the design, uh, it's a sensitive, contextual, uh, uh, very appropriate uh, design given the character of the building and the surrounding buildings. Bruce, do you want to uh, explain your design to the board? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, our, we looked at different ways to um, you know, add square footage to this existing property. And we, looking at the footprint of the existing barn, if you could go to the um, plot plan, existing plot plan, one before that. There it is. Oh, that's it. Um, the barn, the existing barn is up against the rear property line, which is kind of an issue for the rear neighbor and also creates kind of an awkward space between the uh, existing house and the barn. Uh, so we quickly realized that rotating that barn and or that, that, that form and pushing it up against the existing house was probably the best way to uh, create open space for the neighbors. So we can go to the next uh, plot plan, please. So here you can see the shadow of, of the existing barn. <clears throat> we basically took that exact footprint and then rotated it to be orthogonal with the house. Uh, and then we added a small bump out on the left, which kind of mimics an existing bump out uh, of the main house up at the street. Next slide, please. So here um, you can see that, you know, the main volume of the proposed addition is that uh, exact dimension of the barn. Uh, and then we took cues from the house itself you know, Jesse's house, but also neighbors' houses, other houses on the street, uh, trying to kind of break down the massing of the proposed addition, uh, mainly, you know, mimicking the um, roof line, extending the roof line, but also shifting it so that it reads as a separate volume, uh, using shed dormers. The two-story bump out is, again, similar to the bump out at the front of the house. Uh, and very similar to a lot of other houses on the street where you see there's kind of a, a series of, of additions that have been added over the years. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is a good telling photograph of kind of the awkward nature of the way the barn is, is sited now. Uh, it's very close to the back of the existing house and not on the same geometry as the house. It's, you know, it's, it's rotated and as I said before, it's right up against the rear property line, which the back neighbor is not thrilled about. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here, it's similar view where you can see by pulling that, the proposed addition closer to, or up against the back of the existing house, we've kind of cleaned up that back area to maximize the space around the house and done our best to keep the volume or the massing of that addition down with the you know roof lines uh, perpendicular the ridge line perpendicular to the street and the shed dormers that's pretty much it in a nutshell so does it uh Im improve the setback with the neighbor that you referenced with the existing barn yeah, it does. I mean, if you can, um, if you go back up two images, yeah. So you can see there's sort of a, a hedge drawn against that back. That's the property line. So rather than having that barn right up against that property line, you know, there's a little more space there. And then also there's a, a lot of green space uh, to the right of our property at the top of the page which, you know, gives a, some relief um, to the neighborhood. And Madam Chair, if I might just add, we have support letters from both of our direct rear of others in the file. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Hearing none, can I have public testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time the Mayor's Office would like to defer to the judgment of this board. Uh, ONS hosted an abutters meeting, which I understand was a very productive one. Uh, the applicant then went on to meet with the JPNC uh, on November 1st. The JPNC uh, taking into consideration uh, the family's needs as well as the uh, strong support from abutters voted to support this proposal. Uh, with that, we'll defer to the board at this time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Paul, are you looking to get a testimony here? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Yeah, my name is Paul Salou. <clears throat> I uh, am the homeowner at 34 Evergreen Street. I directly abut this property um, at 28 Evergreen Street. I am in complete and total support of this project. As uh, the lawyer mentioned, um, Jesse and his family have grown up in the house. They've got three generations there. Um, and if anyone deserves to have something like this approved, it is their family. Again, I am the direct abutter um, on Evergreen Street to the right-hand side, so this project obviously affects me quite a bit. But um, I, that said, I'm in complete support of the project, and I strongly uh, uh, encourage the board to approve to let um, Jesse and his family have a little bit more space for, uh, for their kids. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I have no additional raised hands. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? There are none. May I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to put forward a motion of approval. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Rewell? Oh, yes. Ms. Barbarazzo? Yes. Mr. Langham? Yes. Ms. Loeb? Yes. Chair also votes yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next, we have two companion cases. First being case BOA 1486693 six, with the address of 16 Mather Street. Along with that, we have case BOA 1486752 with the address of 16R Math, Mather Street. If the applicant and or their representative is present, will they explain to the board? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Michael Chavez. 
Um, I'm the representative for the owners, uh, and they are also here, Kofi Taka and uh, Shanti Kleiman. Um, I, my address is 26 M Hill Park in Dorchester. Um, some context for the project, this, the overall proposal here is the conversion of a, uh, a carriage house that's in the rear of an existing two-family uh, into an additional dwelling unit. Um, the, you know, some, some background here is that uh, uh, the owners were part of the Mayor's Office of Housing's first um, pilot exploration of, of detached ADUs and carriage house conversions back in 2021. So they were one of eight homeowners who went through a process to explore this concept. Uh, they will be, there's one currently under construction now in JP, and if they get this through, this will be the second one that will be from that original cohort. And of course, there's been a few others that have gone through this process and through this board before. Um, uh, owners are submitting for, uh, submitted for permitting last year. Um, all the zoning variances that were listed on the refusal are existing conditions of the lot and of the existing house that are on there now. Um, th there's no proposed work that's actually triggering any uh, zoning violations with the conversion of the lot other than the second dwelling on a single lot due to the, the, the concept of the additional dwelling unit as it currently works in the city of Boston. Um, there are some small dormers being added to the, uh, to the carriage house itself, um, but again, those are not triggering uh, any zoning violations. Um, the ADU will have all its utilities tied into the existing house to ensure that they can't be subdivided in some future time. Uh, so the, the electrical water and sewer will all be connected to the basement of the existing two family and um, you know, continue to behave as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, it will also have a fire alarm fire protection system uh, in compliance with uh, the fire code. Um, the fire department just released a, a new AD, detached ADU code compliance uh, guidance book in December, um, and this, this ADU meets all of those criteria as it's been designed. Um, so that will be going through, obviously, BFD uh, after this process as part of the permit approval process again. Um, and um, that's the kind of quick overall summary there. Um, the, uh, the actual structure itself will remain the same again and will, you know, the aesthetic of it will be kept as a carriage house visually from the exterior as well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Questions from the board? Hearing none, we have public testimony. Madam Chair, members of the board, Connor Newman with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. This time the Mayor's Office like to defer to the judgment of this board. Uh, due to personnel changes, we, we don't have much information on this specific proposal. Uh, with that, also we'll, we'll defer to the board. Thank you. Yep. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Ayumi De Omuiwa, the Office of City Councilor Brian Morrell. In regards to this project, the applicant met with uh, Melville Park, which they presented the project. So no, um, we have received no letters of opposition on this project, and given the nature of it, we want to be on record and support. Okay, Kim, and then Kobe. Yes, um, my name is Kim Donners. Um, we have a business around the street over 50 years around the corner. I believe this project will be a great opportunity to add much needed home ownership without negativity impacting the neighborhood. Change is hard, but it is needed for more housing and we are in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Kofi? Madam Chair, board, thank you very much. Um, I'm here with Shanti Kleiman, I'm Kofi Taha, we are the homeowners, and we just want to add that we did the abutters meeting on... Thank you, sir. We, we appreciate it, but we know you support it. We're doing public testimony right now. Annie? Are there other raised hands? Hi, my name is Annie Grealish. I live at Four Lake Street, Brighton, Mass. I'm a longtime Brighton resident and business owner, a member of the Brighton Alston Improvement Association. I'm speaking today to show my full support for this project that is Are you being speaking proposed. To 42 Waverly or 16 Mather? 42 oh. Waverly. Okay, so we're not on that yet. Thank oh, that's okay. the next case. Thank you. Oh sorry. I have no additional reasons. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? Hearing none, may I have a motion? 
Madam Chair, I make a motion for approval. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge? Yes. Mr. Valencia? Yes. Ms. Wewo? Yes. Ms. Barbarazzo? Yes. Mr. Langham? Yes. Ms. Logue? Yes. Chair also votes yes. The motion carries. Good luck. Thank you, members of the board. Have a good day. Next, we have case BOA 1552468 with the address of 42 Wakefield Street. If the applicant and or their representative present to the plain case report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Sembridge. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Attorney John Pulgini on behalf of the applicant on Waverly Street. With me this afternoon is Ian Gleason, who's the owner of the property. 40-42 Waverly Street, the zoning in this neighborhood is 3F4000. The lot size is 13,626 square feet. This proposal is to construct a new 14-unit residential building with 14 underground parking spaces on a com combined lots of 40 and 42 Waverly Street in Brighton. The current buildings will be raised under a separate permit. Um, the proposed residential building will have will be three stories, and the unit mix is as follows. There will be 10 two-bed, two-bathroom units. Those average about 990 square feet. One, I'm excuse me, four one-bed, one-bath units, and those average 724 square feet. This project will also include the construction of backyard patios, private decks, for the 14 units and communal decks. There are a number of multi-unit apartment buildings along Waverly Street in addition to two and three family dwellings. So the project this size should fit with the current residential context of the street, especially because it is such a, uh, a large lot. I just want to spend a few minutes going over the violations. Uh, we were cited for the following violations. However, some, several of them were issued in error. We have uh, an open space violation. The requirement is 650 square feet. We're at 473 square feet. Additional lot area is 4,000 for the first two, 2,000, that's an active violation. FAR, 0.8 is allowed, we're at a 1.29. A front yard setback, the modal is 12 feet, we're at 15 feet. This is not a violation, as, once, as everyone on this board knows, once you have two houses in the same block, the minimum setback becomes the modal. That would remove both the front yard violation as well as the existing building alignment. And also with the rear yard, the requirement in the zoning subdistrict is 30 feet. We are at 55 feet. This again was another violation issued in error. You measure the rear lot line on an irregular shaped lot from the line most distant and opposite from the front lot line. The rear lot line must be at least 10 feet in width. So our rear lot is 55 feet and is in a uh, 30 foot required zone. Off street parking, there are 28 spaces required. It's two spaces per unit and we're providing 14 spaces, all of which will be uh, EV prepped ready. And <clears throat> these units will be, additionally, they'll be home ownership condominium, and two of the units will be designated affordable. Uh, right now, one is a two bed, which we feel we could reconfigure into a three bed, because it's a larger unit as an affordable, and the other will be a one bed. Additionally, uh, there will be an elevator in this building, so all of the units will be accessible, which is not commonly found in such a smaller building. I just want to spend a minute um, on the BPDA recommendation, because that recommendation was issued based upon the erroneous refusal letter. The planner <coughs> based the main reason for the recommendation on a rare yard is the plans review has cited the smaller section of four feet, one inches. We are 55 feet from the, from the uh, rear lot line in the 30 foot zone. Same <clears throat> with front yard and existing building alignment. Also, they stated one affordable in that um, recommendation when we have been dealing with the BPDA staff for several months on two affordable units. And finally, I just want to say that these units will be priced lower than the current um, buildings in the area on a square foot basis. It would be hundreds of dollars less than the higher luxury buildings. Happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Any questions from the board? Yes, I, I just confirmed that you said that you are providing two IDP units in case uh, the project is approved. That is correct. And, and that there is a housing uh, agreement at this moment or not for those yep. units? This was this was months in the making. We've been dealing with this for several months with the BPDA on that. 
Okay. So Mr. Valencia asked if there was a, a ID, is there an agreement in place or in the works? No, we just, because obviously you don't have a project until you, you know, class past the ZBA hurdle. So we just reached out early with the BPDA, let them know what our intention was. And, uh, and that is what our intention is. And as I stated, we have currently a two and a one, but um, this backyard has like play area for kids and things like that. So the, the two bedroom could actually be um, changed into a three bed and that would be an affordable unit. Mr. Hampton, can you weigh in? Because uh, Attorney Pogini is focusing on the uh, setback as the recommendation, why the recommendation for denial, but the recommendation references reduction of number of units and massing uh, to match built environment. So it's, it's not focused on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, I can agree with the Attorney Pogini on some of the inaccuracies of uh, the rejection letter that. I think a lot of our decision was based on. Um, I know that in this particular street that there are multifamilies. At this point in time, I think the number of units was a little excessive, but with that being said, that was based on one IDP unit being uh, referenced by our uh, neighborhood planner and not two. So that may have changed the vote. I can't speak to that because the vote is what it is, and that's what Amy Chambers sent to you. But uh, you know, two IDP units is a lot different than one, and that may have affected the uh, the decision. Okay. And as far as the other multi families in the area, I mean, I'm trying to go up and down the street, and they they appear to be no more than six units. Am I in, in general? In general, is that a fair assessment? Or Ms. Barraza, I know you usually focus a little bit more on that. Yes, I'm trying to get a handle on 30 Waverly Street to see how many units are on that one. I mean, I see one that looks like a larger multi-residence, but the rest seem to be three and six families. In the meantime, are there any other questions? Madam Chair, I have a question following up on the affordability. What levels of afford affordability have been contemplated so far? So we're, these are um, condominiums. Uh, we're thinking 80% um, and 70% AMI. So lower on the second AMI. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? Hearing none, we have public testimony. Yes, good morning, uh, excuse me, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Frank Mendoza here, also in Brighton liaison for the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Um, here to testify that uh, we did have an abutters meeting for this project uh, last on December the 5th, 2023. Uh, in that meeting, some attendees expressed concerns and of the attending abutters who had concerns, they included uh, insufficient parking, size, density, privacy, and affordability. Um, some attendees were in support of the project. The Austin Civic Association sent a letter this morning to the Board of Opposition. The Brighton Austin Improvement Association is on to testify. I believe it's either the President Dan Daly or John Bly. As to their stance, um, our office did also receive seven letters of opposition from residents of Waverly Street. One letter which was sent without an address, also in opposition. One letter of opposition from the larger community and one letter of support from abutters, 13 letters of support from the larger community, and one letter of support from a non-resident uh, non of Brighton, former resident of Brighton. Uh, with that said, our office would like to defer to the judgment of the board at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, other raised hands? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Daniel Daly. I'm the president of the Brighton Alston Improvement Association. The BAI has voted to support this project. We understand that some of the neighbors have fears of losing their residential character to too much density, but we supported this project because the project is within the allowed height, not changing the character of the neighborhood, and its proposal is not far off from, from the use, but yet providing 14 home ownership units with two affordable units along with an elevator for accessibility. 
in uh, parking for everyone. The, the design is also in the character uh, of, of a house versus a large apartment building, and we think that was complementary to the existing housing stock on Waverly Street. And this project will provide much needed home ownership and two affordable and it's important to build projects of this scale for luxury buildings, uh, in which prices that may be more affordable. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we have you, Matt. Thank you, Ben. Yep. Thank you, Matt, and chair, members of the board. My name is Yvette Colazzo, and I'm a homeowner adjacent to this proposed project. It is erroneous to say that we have multifamily size and scale of this type of project in the neighborhood. I was an original owner of one of the bills that this developer builder did do. I think it was adequate to say that three and six families are what we have in the neighborhood. We do not have something with 14, 15 units. This unit is squarely in the middle of a block that does not have any cut through. So if there was a fire or an emergency, I would be afraid for 14 people to be able to get out of that building in a calm manner when you can't even use an elevator, especially if you're trying to provide accessibility. So I just wanna go on the record to say I'm completely and vehemently opposed to this plan as it is currently being presented for the various zoning breaches that it presents. As concerned citizen of this project, it contradicts and conflicts with many of the zoning guidelines that exist. Many may say the zoning requirements are outdated, but we disagree. This particular neighborhood, which I live in, was established to provide homeowners with green space and room from the congestion from the center of Boston. As, newer, as a newer homeowner who has purchased from this builder and live in this part of Boston for nearly six years, I appreciate respect our neighbors and our desire to keep the appeal of this neighborhood by not overpopulating or developing the immediate area adjacent to our homes. It is enough we are being confronted with various projects in the periphery where high rises are being established without any regard to the infrastructure or the impact this density already will have on our neighborhood. And mind you, those big buildings are going to accommodate affordable housing in a bigger way. Given the Notch Brewery and other established businesses, as well as the activities that already happen along the Charles River, we're becoming a destination to visit. This means the space around us, the parking and green space already becoming challenged. One may argue bikes and buses serve as a purpose. We see Ubers racing down our street and parking spaces meant for residents being taken. This bill being proposed only exacerbates the problem without having the proper accommodation for the congestion being created. If we grant relief today to the request for variance exceptions, we start a precedent of encroaching on immediate homes where we are trying to promote families and home ownership with space to play and a neighborhood that's free from density. Zoning rules exist for a reason. Today's proposal is asking for too many exceptions, which if granted would negate the reason why this committee set the criteria in the policy. So we can ensure that the right development and building are happening in the right areas. Further, so that projects are proposed and developed that are fit for purpose in the respective areas of Boston. We are supporters of reasonable home ownership for all socioeconomic levels, but also we strongly believe that this must come with responsible development and building and not a detriment to those in the area where we have where residents have been for many years. If we allow this project to proceed as is, this negates all the efforts to date to contain and maintain properly scoped neighborhoods that can support the bill being proposed. A 14 unit building in the middle of a residential neighborhood conflicts with this purpose and what this committee is supposed to be the guardians of. Guardians and stewards to promote proper and responsible development and building as of right was and is how this project should proceed and in accordance with zoning policy currently in place. This builder is fully aware of what meets this criteria. We have been supportive of his projects in the past. And we ask that in Colazzo. Thank you. I am wrapping up. Thank you. Thank you. And we ask that this committee hold this project to that standard and not over densify a specific neighborhood an area that cannot support what is being proposed today respectfully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll ask okay. other others to please add to that and not repeat information. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca and then Thomas. Are you both unmuted? Hi, uh, this is Rebecca Michaels. Um, I live across the street at 43 Waverly Street. I also own 41 Waverly Street. Um, I think that Ian has done a good job on the projects to date. However, this one goes beyond what is reasonable. He requires, um, he's required to have 2,800 square feet, 28,000 square feet. He has 14,000 square feet. That's 
half of what he needs to build this building. This building re would represent a 600% increase in the density. Um, it costs us green space. It increases the non-permeable ground cover. It takes down canopy trees. I'm very much in favor of affordable housing, but I think that the, the cost of this project to the community and the city at large is out of proportion to the expected gain of two units of affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> Mayor Wu has emphasized the need for us to plan better and more thoughtfully, and I really don't think this project does it. Uh, one of the other issues is that the um, other buildings in the area, the along the periphery. Hello? Hello? Please wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Um, the buildings along the periphery are still not at full occupancy, so I think really we need a pause before we start to do something like this within the within the direct um, in the neighborhood itself. Also, there are no six-unit buildings on this um, block except for at the corner of Mackin and Waverly. Everything else in this house, in this building in this block is no bigger than three units. Thank you. Thomas. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thomas Leonard. I live at 50 Aldi Street, Apartment 2, Alston, Massachusetts, yeah, Ward 22. And I uh, just want to uh, speak in opposition uh, to this particular project. As others have stated, um, the developer, Ian, has done uh, great projects in the neighborhood, but this one is too dense. The area that I would like to focus on, additional lot area insufficient. Uh, as proposed, um, this project would require 28,000 square feet, um, and the proponent has less than half uh, of that. At, at under 14,000. Uh, compromise with the neighborhood could be uh, two threes or two fours. And uh, just because you're doing two threes or two fours doesn't mean you need to take out that affordable unit. So I uh, just want to uh, go on the record in opposition. Thank you. We have no additional raised hands. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, mine up for representing the carpenters union. Would like to go on record and support. See you, Paula Alexander. Are you speaking on the project? Very much. Um, okay. I'm Paula Alexander, 226 North Harvard Street in Alston. I'm a lifelong um, resident and homeowner of Alston and Brighton. Um, and I vehemently oppose this particular project. It's it just doesn't fit in, in the uh, lot. Um, no matter how they try and, and um, present their numbers and it's not that big, and uh, it, if you went in person and looked at it, you would see that it's just cramming this, this particular design in between two smaller lots. And it it's really doesn't belong in that particular area. Um, I know I'm very familiar with the with the residents, long-time homeowners. Uh, they keep their houses beautiful, and to have this dumped on them is really unfair. There are thousands of new apartments abutting uh, uh, Western Ave and Leo Birmingham Parkway, and to insist on approving a project like this of this size is really. Um, it's really a slap in the face to the uh, present abutters and homeowners, and I, I hope you can reconsider and really, really uh, uh, ask the proponent to go back to the drawing Thank board and, and, um, and uh, listen to the abutters. Yes. Yes, Thank you. Are there, are there any other raised hands? And how many? Oh, no, Madam Chair. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, there, there is uh, seven raised hands, yes. It's, seven? Uh, it's okay, a, well, we're not going to take seven. We can take two more and see where we go. Jessica? Okay, um, I'll go to uh, Melinda. And please keep then, it brief. And then Brian. You've both been unmuted, Melinda, and then Brian. I would ask the others to p submit your, your position on the, on the chat, whether it's for or against, but keep that, that brief too. Okay, hey, Brian, go ahead. Hello, uh, Madam House and members. I just wanted to also um, oppose for this project because it's definitely too massive. Uh, I looked up through uh, three families that recently built. I lived here for over 20 years. I lived on 32 Waverly Street. And the three families were approved as 38 
44, 50, and 54, there were three families. A 14 unit is too big for the street. And that's, I just want to add that in, but I believe the project, you know, the developer is great, but I would like to see maybe like three, three units for each lot, because that's what we have down the street. So Thank I just you. want to give my info. Thank you Thank very you. much. Next. Okay, Ty, Chen. Ty, Ty, Chen. Can you hear? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I live in 32 Waverly Street. Is, um, the area is really congested. And even sometimes I go out, go on the street, go out, leaving my driveway and take, I will see, we see five, six cars run by. If you build a 14 units in on our street, then I believe on my street, on my 32 street, and can have a traffic light one. Because you might wait for 10 cars and go by and cannot get out the street. It's really, I really against, um, that are building 14 units on our street, Waverly Street. Thank you. Are we also with testimony? Yeah, yeah Madam Chair, this is Javier. I, I think uh, at this point, uh, we can ask any members who wish to put their opposition support in the chat and we can make a record of it. Already done, but I'll ask again if uh, anyone else wants to uh, weigh in to please uh, provide their comments in the chat. In the meantime, are there any other questions from the board? Madam Chair, could I have an opportunity just to respond to all those comments? Then it'll be very quick. Yes, I just want to see if anyone has any questions from the board that you can include in your response. Okay, hearing none, then please, please. I just wanted to go over this whole project. You know, we have minimal dimensional violations. We have no height in either stories or feet. We have no rear yard violation, no side yard violation, no front yard violation. And I understand the neighbors are concerned about parking. This developer went through the effort and I think everybody can appreciate how expensive it is to put parking below grade in a 14 unit building. And what that was able to do was to provide one for one parking, which I think everybody on the board, if this was an article 80 project, they'd be pushing back at 0.5. So we're one-to-one -one parking requirements that are off-street parking contained inside the building, and that was able to lower the building. It's not dwarfing anybody. This building is not overshadowing any of the other buildings. It is a larger building on two lots, not one lot. And, you know, again, home ownership, which is what Brighton needs, and most importantly, it is a affordable market rate units because it's not a luxury high-rise building. It does have all the amenities. It has a gym bike rooms, it has elevator and things like that, so it's accessible. But overall, it's hundreds of dollars square foot less than a, a regular building or you know one of the buildings you see all over Brighton and Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the board? May I have a motion? Madam Chair, um, I'm gonna put forward a motion of denial without prejudice. Um, I think that uh, the project scale at 14 is too large uh, for the context that's within. Uh, I think the applicant should come back with a much more um, sizable pr proposal, you know, ranging uh, at least, uh, you know, at the max, maybe 12, 10 to 12 seems reasonable with these two combined laws. That would allow for a much more open space. Currently, the project is. Uh, really maximizing its lot coverage, and therefore, I'm putting forward that motion of um, denial without prejudice. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Stembridge. Yes. Mr. Valencia. Yes. Ms. Wewell. Yes. Ms. Bedavraza. Yes. Mr. Langham. Yes. Ms. Logue. Yes. The chair also votes yes, the motion carries. Thank you everybody, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right, see you all next time. Have a good one. Recording stopped.